Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's so nice to see everybody. I'm going to give everybody a second to get in. <clears throat> so fun to see everybody popping up. We're up to four different little like slideshow rooms. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Baltimore Jewelry Center Online Symposium. Public school. I'm going to ask that everybody mute. Course around Massachusetts. There we go. If everyone can mute, that's going to help us all hear better. Thank you. Again, I'm Shane Prada. I'm the director here at the BJC. It's really <laughs> wonderful to have everybody here with us on Zoom. This is our sixth annual symposium and it's our third annual online symposium. It's so wonderful to have guests from all over the world. Our jewelry community is vast and it's super special to be here together. Um, once again, as you come on, if you can mute and remain muted, that will provide the best viewing experience and listening experience for everyone. While you're muted, we encourage you to use the chat. You can drop questions, comments, exclamations, whatever you wanna say in the chat. In order to make sure you have the best screen view of the presentation, we're suggesting that you utilize speaker view. And just as a reminder, we are gonna have a time at the end of each presentation, and then again at the end of all the presentations for questions and comments. So again, hold your questions and comments or put them in the chat. Thanks for muting, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm joined today by my wonderful colleagues, Jen Moore, Elliot Keeley, and Allison Gulick. Um, this is our sixth annual symposium, as I, as I said, and it's the third one that we're featuring an online portion for. We've really enjoyed hosting the speaker portion of our symposium online, as it allows anyone anywhere to take part. We've had over 225 people registered for today, which is really exciting. Nice big number, not getting nervous. <laughs> if you don't already know about the Baltimore Jewelry Center, we're a nonprofit arts education space located in Baltimore, Maryland. We offer classes and workshops and studio rental for both new and established metal and jewelry artists. We also host exhibitions, like the one you can see behind me, free workshops and educational events to reach even more people. We have a robust residency program, a kids and teens program, and we're super passionate about helping people learn to create jewelry, wear jewelry, and learn about the field. Elliot's gonna drop a link into the chat, and that's the link to our website if you wanna check it out at any point today. As I mentioned, this is our sixth annual symposium. We developed the idea for an annual symposium back in 2017, which seems so long ago, but isn't that long ago, after we decided to host a symposium around Radical Jewelry Makeover, a year-long jewelry repurposing project that we hosted. We wanted to host a day of making and learning that was accessible to both jewelers and makers and those who've never made any jewelry. Since that first symposium in 2017, we've hosted a symposium every fall. By organizing the day around a broader theme, we're able to highlight the ubiquity of jewelry and make new connections with people outside of the metals and jewelry field. Our 2022 symposium theme is signs, signals, and symbols. And it explores the role that jewelry plays as a cultural signifier. Throughout history, jewelry has been utilized to visually indicate a wearer's preferences, characteristics, attitudes, and beliefs. Today, we'll listen and learn from our presenters as they discuss how jewelry and wearable art relate to political movements, gender, excuse me, how, how Jewelry and wearable art relate to political movements, gender and sexual identity, as well as cultural communication and practices. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be hosting a day of free workshops related to the topic as well, which is actually sold out, which is very exciting. And we're also gonna have an open exhibition call related to the symposium. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the very end of today. Um, before we begin, I do wanna say again, a huge thank you to our team over here at the BJC. Elliot, Allison, and Jen have worked so hard over the past several weeks really months to develop this program and deliver it to you online. They're amazing collaborators and I feel very fortunate to work with them. I also wanna thank instructors, Andy Lowry and Molly Shulman and our interns and residents who've helped prepare materials for the in-person portion of the symposium, which I said will be held tomorrow. I wanna to say a big thank you to the BJC board. They helped me facilitate the funding that makes these types of programs possible. And I wanna say thank you to the Wingate Foundation and the Maryland State Arts Council and our amazing donors, many of whom are here, who provide funding for this completely free program and so many of the programs that we run at the BJC. Finally, I would like to thank our five presenters for being with us today and sharing their research and their smart minds. I'm really excited to hear from them and I know you are too. So without further ado, we're gonna get started. For today's format, 
We have four presentations. And as I said, there's gonna be time between each presentation for some Q&A. So, so feel free to be dropping questions and comments into the chat. And then at the end of all four presentations, there'll be even more time for Q&A. So our first speaker today that we'll hear from is Dr. Victoria Pass. Vicki is a professor of fashion and design history at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Her research considers the history of fashion culture in the 20th century and focuses specifically on issues of gender and race. Her essay, Racial Masquerades in the Magazines, Defining White Femininity Between the Wars, was published in the Journal of Modern Periodical Studies in 2020. She's also co-edited two books, Design Beyond the Canon with Jennifer Kaufman Bueller and Christopher Wilson, and Women's Magazines in Print and New Media with Noli Rooks and Ayana Weekly. Her writing has appeared in Fashion, Style and Popular Culture, Omenka Magazine, Design and Culture, and Be More Art. Vicki earned a PhD in Visual Cultural Studies from the University of Rochester. And I'll also say that Vicki helps us every year to help to organize this symposium. And she's just incredibly vital to this program and to many of the programs that we run here. So I'm gonna turn it over to Vicki and give you a last reminder that you can drop questions and comments into the chat. All right, Vicki. Thank you so much, Shane. It's it's wonderful to speak to the BJC audience. Um, it's it's a um, it feels like home to me at the BJC. Um, and someday I'm going to actually take lessons there. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, I love seeing everyone's work there and um, conversations I've had with um, with folks uh, at the BJC and um, all of the amazing programming um, that you all do. Um, and it's been an honor to be a tiny part of it. Um, so uh, suffrage fashion, let's talk about it. Um, so let me do the awkward thing where I share my screen and I have to talk about it for a minute and I share it and then you can see it. I hope. <laughs> so um, I'm calling my presentation um, uh, a double bind, uh, fashion the suffrage movement, because as I was kind of working through this research, which has been really fun, um, it uh, became clear to me that um, fashion was a kind of double bind for those who were involved uh, in the suffrage movement and specifically the women who were involved in the suffrage movement. There were men who were involved in the movement, but um, it was women who were trying to gain the right to vote in this movement. And um, fashion was a tool that could be used to craft and imagine kind of radically different kind of way of being a uh, feminine and way of being a woman um, and might create more space for, um, wait, I cannot see my slides. Hang on just a second. Um, okay, let's try that way. How about now? Vicki, we can't, we still can't see your slides. Oh, if, no. you, if you'll stop screen sharing, maybe we yep. can try, just start over. Oh, I think it's my, I, I might need to leave Zoom for a second. Okay. Is anybody wearing any jewelry that they're excited about? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Shane was vamping. <laughs> How, 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 how about now? You good? It looks good. Thank you. Okay. My, my apologies all. It's been a while since I taught online. Thank goodness. Um, okay. Uh, so yes. So fashion for women who are involved in the suffrage movement could be this tool for creating kind of radically different way of being a woman. Um, it might offer comfort and practicality um, and mobility, um, but it, was also a challenge <laughs> to traditional ways of understanding femininity. Um, and so other suffrage activists turned to it as a tool for crafting a kind of reassuring, traditional, more conservative, respectable kind of femininity. But there was also a lot of anxiety about the kind of frivolousness of fashion, um, that it signified something frivolous about women. Um, and essentially what women were trying to do as they were campaigning for the vote was to show that they would be responsible voters, that they were worthy of being full citizens. Um, and I would like to say that feels so far away, but in some ways I think 
these questions are as re relevant as ever um, globally, um, but also in the US. Um, but fashion also provided a kind of form of radical visibility, which I think is really interesting as we think about you know, what happened during the suffrage movement for all of these activists. So I think one of the kind of fashion moments from the suffrage movement that most of us are probably familiar with if we're familiar with anything are bloomers, um, which is really interesting because they had a very short lived moment on the suffrage scene. Um, I think struggles for women's suffrage certainly predated 1848, which was um, the um, moment uh, of the Seneca Falls Convention, which is, you know, often thought of as like the beginning of the American suffrage movement. Um, but it's, it's quite soon after in the 1850s that women begin to adopt uh, bloomers. Um, but it's really a small handful of them. They get their name from Amelia Bloomer because she was the one who published about them in her uh, newspaper, The Lily, which helped them to get attention. But it was actually the woman you see here in the middle, Elizabeth Smith Miller, who um, seems to have been the person who initially started wearing them. Um, and interestingly, she had her husband and father's permission to wear them while she was visiting her father in Washington, D.C. He was a congressman. Um, and the style was reported on while she was there on this trip, and that was sort of how they took off. Women had worn pantalettes in private for exercise in the United States, but they had never worn them in public. And if you look at the images I have here, you can see on the left, kind of one of the inspirations, one of the key inspirations for women who were taking on this style, which was uh, Turkish trousers, they were often called, but they were also, they were worn by women in Turkey, also Algerian women wore them. Women um, in uh, different parts of North Africa wore them. Um, and you can see they're very voluminous. Um, part of the anxiety around pants, um, and women wearing them, I should say trousers, because if we have any British listeners, you'll think I'm talking about the wrong thing. Um, but but uh, was the sort of division of the legs and like getting anywhere near the genitalia. So the voluminous quality of um, the trousers that were worn um, by women in places like Algeria was very appealing. And you can see also that Smith Miller and Bloomer uh, styled uh, their bloomers with um, long skirts uh, over them. And here you can see Amelia Bloomer in a photograph herself wearing them. And they were really great right off the bat because if you saw a woman in bloomers, you knew immediately she was a suffrage activist. And they created a spectacle. They were unusual on the street. People kind of wanted to see what the fuss was about so you could attract people when you were giving speeches. Susan B. Anthony wore them for a while. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wore them. So a lot of the major players whose names have come down to us from this period um, wore them, but also professional women like Dr. Mary Edwards uh, Walker wore them. Um, they made traveling a lot easier. They were a lot lighter weight than the many, many layers of skirts and um, petticoats that women were wearing at the time. Um, but on the other hand, um, they were viewed by many, most in the general public as a kind of horrifying symbol that women were trying to be like men. Um, heaven for fend. Um, and here you can see two British uh, cartoons um, from the magazine Punch, uh, which show some of the horrifying effects of bloomerism. A docile husband on the left pushing his child in a carriage as his wife waits at the door. Um, and then horror of horrors, a woman who is working uh, in her office um, and not caring for the family, the father is left to care for the family, um, and, and, the, and the girls all in the family have bloomers on too. So she's passing on bloomerism. So they became an easy way for opponents of women's suffrage and women's rights more broadly um, to target the movement and to argue that if women got the right to vote, the world would just be turned upside down. They would take power from men. And you can see pants are a very potent signifier for power in a way that I think can be easy for us to take for granted now when, you know, um, people of all genders um, wear, wear trousers pretty regularly. But that is really relatively recent. If you think about it, and I've talked to um, many female identifying folks who've told me that 
uh, they still aren't allowed to wear uh, trousers to work or they weren't allowed to until relatively recently. I mean, I remember growing up, I couldn't wear trousers to synagogue. Um, so <laughs> I think we, we're still kind of negotiating um, this. So the other interesting thing to come out of this moment too is the first laws against dressing uh, in the clothing of the opposite sex. These were essentially laws that were put in place um, to police uh, queer people and queer culture. Um, but I think also to police um, women's rights because they begin to be put in place, guess what, in 1848 when this convention takes place. I don't think that's an accident. First law goes into effect in 1848 in Columbus, Ohio. Um, in the 1850s, many US cities follow suit. This is probably also related to the fact that cities are growing in the United States as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And as a result, you see the growth of, um, of queer communities, um, first gay communities, and then later on lesbian communities in those cities. Um, and so putting these laws into place to police those communities, the very same laws that were used to police folks who were at the Stonewall Inn, um, uh, which was part of what sparked uh, the Stonewall riots. Here you can see Mary Wa Edwards Walker, um, who uh, dispensed with bloomers and just started wearing mostly men's clothing. Um, she said uh, in 1897, I'm the original new woman. I have prepared the way for the girl in knickerbockers. Um, she was arrested multiple times uh, under these laws for impersonating men, um, but she had won a Congressional Medal of Honor for her service in the Civil War and claimed that Congress had given her special permission to dress up this way. So. Uh, she is just one of many, many stories, um, but just wanted to point, point you to, to that history. Um, and uh, Susan Stryker's transgender history is a great source for more information on this if, um, if you want to learn more. I think it's really important too to notice or to note that bloomers were not an option for all women. Um, for example, Black women, because of the ways in which they were marginalized, mar marginalized excuse me, and the ways in which white supremacy um, was in operation, they really had to create a kind of conventional image of middle-class femininity that aligned with white standards of propriety. So wearing bloomers for them um, really would um, just compound the ways in which um, they were being targeted by virtue of their race. And I think interestingly, Sojourner Truth talks about this, but in a slightly different way, um, here you can see a quote from her where she's saying that, um, you know, she is not interested um, in wearing bloomers. She says someone came, came around and asked her why she didn't wear bloomers. And she said, I wore bloomers enough when I was enslaved. And so for truth, bloomers were a sign of enslavement. They were a sign of the time in which she was forced to wear them, forced to wear trousers in order to do the hard work that she did as, as an enslaved person. And so she had no interest in going back to that, that the clothing that she donned for these beautiful photographs that she had taken of herself was um, more uh, evidence of her life um, as, as a free woman. On the other hand, Harriet Tubman wanted bloomers. Um, so, uh, and this is in a very different circumstance. Harriet Tubman, um, was leading um, all of these enslaved people to freedom. And during uh, the Civil War, um, she had an essential role doing this. Um, and she wrote in 1863, um, after leading the Kobahi River Raid, um, in which she and 150 African-American Union soldiers rescued more than 700 slaves during this raid, that she wished she had a pair of bloomers uh, to do this work in. She said, I want a bloomer's dress made of some coarse, strong material to wear on expeditions. In our late expedition up the Kombahi River and coming on board the boat, I was carrying two pigs for a poor sick woman who had a child to carry. And the order was given, the order double quick was given. And I started to run, stepped on my dress, it being rather long and fell and tore it almost off. So that when I got on board the boat, there was hardly anything left but shreds. I made up my mind then that I would never wear a long dress in another expedition of the kind but I would have a bloomer as soon as I could get it. Sadly, we don't have any pictures of Harriet Tubman wearing bloomers, but I think that there's a reason for that. She recognized that she needed to be photographed in this way as a respectable middle-class woman who was adhering to really white standards of beauty and self-presentation and femininity 
rather than in really a kind of army uniform for her role um, in, the, in the Union Army. So as I said, bloomers fall out of favor uh, pretty quickly. It's around like eight years that people are wearing, the women are wearing them. Um, and it was multiple reasons, really. On the one hand, it was because of all the backlash against the bloomers costume. It got in the way of uh, suffragists' method message um, about uh, their demand uh, for the vote. Um, and um, also the cage crinoline came into fashion. Um, and you can see uh, one here on the right-hand side um, in the 1860s. And uh, believe it or not, a lot more comfortable than lots and lots of petticoats to give your skirt volume. And the cage crinoline is also collapsible. So it's not so heavy. Uh, so it, it does create somewhat more mobility. Uh, believe it or not, you can sit in these. Um, I, can, I have diagrams of how, how they flatten when people sat in them. Um, but the problem was the bloomers image stuck. Um, and this association with bloomers would um, really dog uh, the suffrage movement for years to come. Uh, when uh, cartoonists were lampooning uh, suffrage activists, they were often showing them in bloomers taking on more masculine roles, uh, you know, uh, taking too much time with their date at the end of the night, as you can see on that cover of the American magazine, Puck, um, or uh, watching uh, the man do the laundry, as you can see in that stereographic card on the bottom left, um, or even in a, a novelty pin that you could have purchased um, somewhere around uh, 1898. Um, and the caption reads, is a souvenir of women's rights. Have you some friend who is bossy or thinks she ought to vote? Send her one or fasten it on the slide or sleeve or the back of her coat and you'll have all the fun you want. Sure to be a great joke for those bossy ladies in your life. So you can see this, this image uh, is quite persistent. Some women by the turn of the century, like 1880s, 1890s, do actually start to wear bloomers. And the reason is bicycles. 1890, the safety bicycle is introduced. That's the bicycle where the two wheels are the same size, not the penny farthing with the giant wheel. <laughs> um, and uh, there were also pneumatic tires um, as opposed to solid rubber ones that are introduced making for a faster, smoother and easier ride. Um, and by the mid 1890s, there was one bike for every 12 New Yorkers. This was like an explosive new technology. And for women cycling, bloomers were a good option. Um, so you can see uh, one of my favorite images of Kitty Toll Knox, um, who was a champion cyclist uh, in a suit that she probably designed herself. She was um, a seamstress as well as being a cycling enthusiast in Massachusetts. Uh, the only African-American woman who was a member of the League of American Wheelmen because right after she joined, they changed the rule to say whites only. But they did let Kitty stay. Um, she's a fascinating character. Um, and then of course we have this astonishing, gorgeous chrysanthemum covered cycling suit uh, from the FIDA Museum in LA um, that is just gorgeous. But most women who are riding bicycles are tending to wear shorter skirts or they're wearing just divided skirts that sort of hide the fact that they're trousers. That's probably what these women on the top right are wearing on Alameda Avenue in Denver. Um, and you can see on the left uh, from Cycling World Illustrated how the uh, divided skirt helps you to, to ride the bike, but still looks like a skirt. Um, so it's a more feminine look. Um, and there is a lot of writing actually among suffrage activists, including, those, uh, including Susan B. Anthony, who felt that um, cycling really created um, a lot of freedom for women. If you think about it, you can't be chaperoned on a bicycle, right? Like you ride it by yourself and you can go wherever you want. And if you got a light on your bicycle, like the woman on the bottom right does, you know, you can ride anywhere you want at night. Um, so it really creates a lot of um, access uh, for women to public spaces. The other thing that's unique about this kind of sporting fashion that's developing is that women are wearing it in public. You're not like wearing it at a gym or on a tennis court. You're wearing it in the park. You're wearing it wherever you're cycling um, in, in broad daylight. Um, so people are seeing it. And it really did have an effect on fashion, although not quite as radical as we might think. So within the suffrage movement itself, 
as with any social movement y'all can think of, there were many, many different opinions uh, about fashion. Um, Sojourner Truth, who styled herself as a respectable middle-class woman, um, even a bit like grandmotherly in her photographs, um, which she sold to raise money for her causes, um, said um, at a 1870 suffrage convention was commenting on um, what she saw as the excesses of the wealthier white women there. She said, what kind of reformers be you with goose wings on your head as if you were going to fly and dressed in such ridiculous fashion talking about reform and women's rights? It appears to me you'd better reform yourselves first. So these are very strong words, but what you can see in the response from editors of the Women's Journal, which was a suffrage journal, is the kind of racism that Truth faced in backlash. So the editors write, considerations of beauty, grace, and taste in dress do not seem to us unworthy of a woman, a true woman or a woman reformer. And we should condemn the angularities and the ungracefulness and the absolute deformity of dress like Sojourner Truth as severely as she would panniers and Grecian backwards. So they basically said, we don't like your clothes either. You're not a real woman. And this was exactly the kind of racism that Sojourner Truth faced throughout her entire career. Um, for folks who know her oeuvre, you probably know her Ain't I a Woman speech and so many incredible moments, which I don't even have time to get into. But what you can see here is the double bind. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Fashion is frivolous but you have to be feminine, but you can't be too feminine, but you can't be too masculine. And if you're not white, then you know, you're know you really out of luck because you really have sort of no space in which to maneuver. Um, so the kinds of images that we see from outside of the movement too show this double bind. So either you're cross-dressing and you're mannish or you're too frivolous and wearing your like giant ridiculous hats um, in order to vote. So you can see that even in the same company producing these anti-suffrage cards, this, those two images, either gender is going to be turned upside down or women are too foolish to deserve the right to vote. Um, you've got more kind of um, somewhat moderate voices from a suffrage activist like Mary Church Terrell, but I think she gives you a sense of the critical ways in which fashion was really important um, in terms of its very careful deployment by African-American women. Um, she uh, said, every woman, no matter what her circumstance, owes it to herself, her family, and her friends to look well, to look as well as her means permit. As a wise selection of colors to be worn plays an important part in securing the best results. Um, and she might have even added, you know, owes it to her race, um, because those were really the stakes uh, for Black women uh, who were a part of this movement and who were, let's face it, constantly being sold out by white suffrage activists um, throughout the movement, um, who were you know, willing to accept that Black women might not get to the right to vote as long as white women did. So simultaneously around this time period, in part due to bicycles, but in part due to advances in um, technology and the emergence of ready-to-wear, you start to see new styles emerging. And the shirtwaist is probably the most iconic example of one of these styles. And it's quite a unique style in that it was worn by women completely across the class spectrum. You could purchase it for almost any price point between 25 cents and $7. Um, if you all are familiar with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, one of the worst uh, industrial disasters in United States history, um, this is what they were producing. These uh, shirts, blouses for women, kind of styled like a men's shirt, but with the fashionable mutton chop sleeve and often with lots of different styles uh, of trim on them. Young working women wore them. You can see the women in the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, Company factory themselves wearing uh, these shirtwaists, um, often with a dark colored skirt. Women in work uh, as clerks, sales girls, teachers wore them. Sporting women wore them, as you can see in this beautiful uh, John Singer Sargent painting, uh, the Stern's bicycle ad, or the ad uh, for Scribner's. Um, they were useful for, for, for participating 
um, in activities like bicycling, hunting, even mountaineering. Um, there were dressier shirtwaists that were available for late afternoon receptions, less formal occasions. It's really kind of the beginnings of an emergence of a more casual American sportswear for women. Uh, Gimbel Brothers in 1915 boldly declared, the woman of other lands occasionally wears a shirtwaist. The American woman occasionally wears something else. Her daily apparel is smart, tailored skirt and neat blouse. It was really a kind of national uniform for American women. And it was one that was about signaling modernity. And it could also hint at their politics. So, you know, triangle uh, shirtwaist workers who were on strike in the years before um, the fire uh, were wearing shirtwaist. You know, it was worn by striking workers. It was worn by sportswomen. It was worn by wealthy women. Um, you can see on the top left, uh, women uh, at Atlanta University were wearing them, uh, college women all over the place. Um, and it created a little bit of space for solidarity across the lines of class and race. But of course, like, let's not get too carried away. But you can see it produced this very exciting image that appealed to illustrators like Charles Danny Gibson of a kind of new modern woman, in his case, often labeled the Gibson girl, um, who uh, was sexy, exciting, alluring, and modern, and also maybe a supporter of women's rights. Um, you never know. So as you start to get these kinds of images in popular culture, you also have suffrage activists thinking about different ways of creating visibility for the movement. Um, there was kind of a period of the doldrums around the turn of the century for the movement when not much was happening. And gradually you start to see the use of buttons um, as a way of publicizing the movement. Alice Park, who was a California-based suffrage activist, um, wrote about these in this beautiful article called Wear the Badge um, in the Women's Journal. Um, the whole of the Women's, or I think the whole of the Women's Journal, you can, you can look at and read on archive.org if you're interested in digging into this. She wrote, the wearing of the badge, which says legibly votes for women, is one of the most useful individual acts that suffragists may do. If one's courage is not sufficient to wear a readable badge, then it is somewhat helpful to wear pretty badges that can be recognized only by the initiated. And this is the collection or part of the collection that Park amassed over her career. And she would wear them to suffrage events. She covered her luggage with stickers that said votes for women instead of the typical hotel sticker. She had a real keen sense really of like communications and graphic design and that was the work that she did. She developed printed material, uh, literature and posters, uh, as well as consumer novelties for the successful 1911 campaign for suffrage in California. And she seems to have played a really critical role in using bold type, brief, clear text, images and maps to great effect. And she also recognized that bright color and kind of graphic images were helpful. She went on to say, the wearing of the badge is significant of progress. Few are worn where suffrage, the suffrage movement is unpopular. Many are worn where it grows in favor. Every badge, pin, or button is a help, arousing curiosity among strangers, stimulating conversation among acquaintances, and discussion among friends and antis, meaning people who are against suffrage. Show your color all day long at home to change the, to change the inquirer at the door, the caller and the tradesman in the streets, and the cars to the chance passerby, and in all the meetings to all who attend. Until women have the courage of their convictions, how can they expect to win recognition and approval? So what she's talking about here is, you have to have the courage to declare yourself as a suffrage activist, and a button was a way of doing that. Uh, you, could, you could declare your allegiance to the movement, you could spark conversations, you could help spread the movement, and you could give people a sense of belonging to this, this group. Political buttons have an exceptionally long history in the United States. They really are, uh, they do seem to be an American um, phenomenon, which is somehow not surprising. The early ones, like these on the top left, were actual garment buttons that you would just like sew onto your garment. Um, and you can see they go back to George Washington. They used to be made after the president won, but eventually with the invention of celluloid and cheaper production processes, they were being made uh, as campaign material. Um, and here are some more examples. Then there was a technique for just printing directly onto the metal for the button, and then they became even cheaper. You also had higher end versions of these buttons. 
uh, such as this uh, hat pin or stick pin on the left commemorating the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, which was probably produced some, somewhere in the mid 1890s. Um, and in Britain, women like Ernestine Mills, uh, who was an arts and crafts um, designer um, and uh, enameler um, metal worker, produced these really beautiful enamel brooches that say votes for women. And there were a number of women who went back and forth between the American women who went back and forth from London and brought a lot of ideas from the British suffrage movement. Um, so there's a lot of cross-pollination between the American and British movements. There you can see Mills uh, in her studio. Um, for local folks, I understand that this um, piece of metalwork um, and enamel work is actually at the Delaware Art Museum. Uh, I haven't seen it, but I thought I would include it. Uh, if you wanna see some of Ernestine Mills work, um, you can see it there. Um, but she would produce um, commemorative, commemorative jewelry um, for people in uh, the suffrage movement in England. Uh, so she produced, for instance, this pendant um, for uh, Louisa um, Eights uh, when she was released from Holloway Prison. You can see it's um, uh, a symbol of hope uh, playing outside of the prison bars. Here you can see Christabel Pankhurst likely wearing one of Mill's pieces. It's hard to tell um, what is suffrage jewelry, um, if it's really suffrage jewelry, unless you have a provenance. But in the UK, the colors they use were purple, white, and green. Um, and you do see a lot of jewelry with that colorway. Um, so it's possible that some of it is suffrage jewelry. And it would be sold at events like this, these bazaars, um, where uh, Mills was likely selling her own work. And you can see her here on the left amongst this group of women. Um, but people were also selling, you know, uh, clothing that they didn't want anymore, unwanted jewelry and things like that as fundraisers. You also got some companies who kind of got in on the act in the United States, like Butler Brothers. Um, it's not clear how profitable <laughs> these um, uh, projects were, but they did raise some funds um, for American suffrage organizations. Um, Butler Brothers was working with the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. Um, and there was a lot of kind of back and forth around images um, that were used. Um, a lot of these kind of heralds and um, allegorical images were borrowed from the British suffrage movement for American suffrage pins. And I think it's important to note too that other causes um, used buttons. It was a very sort of potent tool. Ida B. Wells, who was a key player in the women's suffrage movement, was also a fearless crusader against lynching um, and was a journalist. Um, and she uh, created uh, buttons for a campaign um, to uh, raise attention to um, what she believed was really the lynching of um, a large number of soldiers um, during uh, a riot that occurred, um, sometimes called the Houston riot or the mutiny. It was an uprising that was sparked by the brutality of white police officers outside of San Antonio against black soldiers who were stationed there during World War I and civilians. Um, here's how the Paris, Texas NAACP described the event. At noon, police dragged an African-American woman from her home and arrested her for public drunkenness. A soldier from the camp asked what was going on and was beaten and arrested as well. When Corporal Charles Baltimore, an MP, learned of the arrest, he went to the police station to investigate. He was beaten and then shot as he was chased away. Rumors soon reached the camp that Baltimore had been killed and that a white mob was approaching. Soldiers armed themselves and began their march towards the city. 16 white people, including four police, were killed, four black soldiers were killed, and ultimately the army court martialed 110 black soldiers 19 of whom um, were executed and 63 received life sentences. So the pin that um, Wells created, um, you can see here uh, was, uh, it says um, the martyred uh, Negro soldiers on it, I believe. Um, and um, it was a way of bringing attention uh, to this event. Um, and in the story in the Chicago Tribune, uh, she describes, um, buying these buttons um, and uh, perhaps uh, trying to bring attention um, to the event rather than to um, make money off of them. The suffrage buttons use symbols like stars to track what states um, were uh, passing suffrage rules. So you can sometimes date these by how many stars they have on them. So 
all well and good to wear buttons, but how else do you bring visibility to the movement? Well, new strategies begin in the 20th century, including parades. Um, and here you can see one of the first um, in New York in 1908, but hard to tell who is an onlooker and who is a parader. So wearing white became the way uh, to show that. Um, and so you can see here how women wearing white show up much more starkly against the darkly dressed, um, mostly men um, in the crowd. People are beginning, these women are beginning to really pay attention to the kind of symbolism that they can use in these parades. So here are some images from a 1912 parade in New York. Um, white was also very much a part of a fashionable wardrobe. You could wear your white shirtwaist. You could wear a fashionable lingerie dress made of white lace. Um, women of all classes would have had something white in their wardrobe which they could use. White was used to represent purity and unity among a very diverse group of women. There were all kinds of tensions as I've been hinting at in the movement. There was racism and classism and xenophobia that was part of the US broadly and was of course present in the movement. But white was a color that lots of different activists um, could agree on. It helped them to create an image of a suffragette that fit in with fashionable dress at the time. It was seen as feminine. And part of the argument that these suffragists were making was that women's femininity made them fit to have the vote, that they would take their morality to the ballot box. They were also keenly aware of how great it looked on camera. Um, you can see the images in the newspaper are pretty fuzzy at this point, but if you have um, a white garment on, they really pop. Here are some great ones from the major parade in Washington, D.C., um, where uh, the crowds like <laughs> came into the parade, women were harassed. It was really the first time that protesters had marched in D.C., so it really totally changed how protests happened in the United States. Um, protesting uh, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration might remind some of us uh, who participated in women's marches um, uh, that that moment um, has historical resonance. Um, there was an effort, um, there were a number of women in DC who were powerful in these suffrage movements who did not want black women marching. Um, but despite uh, their uh, requests and Alice Paul telling black women like Ida B. Wells, mm, maybe you should march at the back. Ida B. Wells was right in there as you can see on the bottom right uh, with her fellow marchers um, from Illinois. And women would also dress in like occupational clothing, clothing. Uh, you know, nurses uniforms um, and so forth. You still had women who wanted uh, to wear trousers. Um, one of them uh, whose story I enjoyed learning about is Annie Tinker, um, who was really interested in showing that women could be a part of the military um, and was to lead a brigade of women on horseback in the New York parade in 1912. She uh, chose tri-corner hats. Suffrage hats were another thing that were often sold by local suffrage organizations to create these kinds of um, you know, cohesive looks for marchers. Uh, one of the marchers here, by the way, on horseback was Mabel Pinghua Lee, um, who was a Chinese American or Chinese immigrant to America. She couldn't get Chinese citizenship at the time. So she was fighting hard for a right to vote that um, we're not even sure if she was ever able to make use of. Um, she passed away in 1966. It's not clear if she ever became a citizen. Um, but these were very diverse um, crowds, which we often don't, don't get from just looking at these um, newspaper pictures. Um, and so ultimately fashion became a tool um, for creating this specific image of, of femininity that became a powerful force in showing that women um, ought to be able to vote. Um, and it was also used um, by Black women um, in civil rights activism that was happening um, in tandem. This was a silent march to protest police treatment of Blacks during riots in East St. Louis um, in 1917, um, the famous silent protest that happened in New York in 1917. So I, as always, I have many other things I can show you, um, but I'm gonna stop um, there and happy to answer questions. And um, uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Oh, Shane, I can't hear you. Sorry, I came off my video and not my, <laughs> I didn't unmute. Thank you, Vicki. I really like that you grounded it um, in all the extensive research that you've done, obviously in fashion, but specifically in pants. I've had the privilege of um, 
hearing Vicki speak about that topic um, before and it's just very fascinating. Um, I do have a couple of questions from the chat that I'll ask. Um, and these, the, the first two come from Maria Kanchake, who's joining us from Belgium. Um, two questions, could you repeat where I can find the historical article, Wear the Badge? Yeah, so that's on a website called archive.org. Um, and I think um, Elliot has a link that he can post in the chat. Um, it's uh, that one was in um, uh, the Women's Journal, um, which you can find issues fully scanned um, and digitized there. Um, and you can also find the suffragist. The Women's Journal, I believe, was one of the more like um, middle of the road publications. Uh, the suffragist was Alice Paul's um, National Women's Party. And I'm sure there are people on the call who know this history even better than I do. Um, that was the more radical uh, organization that was really linked to the, the Pankhurst in England and a lot of their tactics. Um, and then Maria's second question was, is there any literature you can recommend about the history of the button? Oh, that's a great question. I didn't find um, much specifically like about buttons generally, um, but um, there are lots of collections um, of them. Um, there's some great books on suffrage memorabilia, and I suspect there are probably lots of books on political memorabilia more broadly. Um, one of the books that I found really helpful in terms of suffrage was a book called Selling Suffrage, which talks a lot about how um, suffrage connected with um, commercial interests at the time. Um, and I feel like I didn't get to say this in my presentation, but I want to because it's a myth busting. Some of y'all may have heard that Elizabeth Arden was selling red lipsticks to, to the suffrage activists and she was a suffragette. That's bogus. That was something she made up later on uh, to help publicize <laughs> her company. Um, I don't think hardly any of these women would have been wearing red lipstick at this time. It's really not until the 1920s that you start to have um, more visible makeup be a part of the kind of average woman's um, wardrobe. Um, they might've been wearing like, you know, powder to lighten their skin tone or um, some blush or things like that, but not not really bright lipstick um, at that point. So that that is a myth that has appeared um, in many books. <laughs> it does not seem to be founded in anything. I didn't figure this out. Other other historians have, have tracked that down. I love the myth busting. Um, so Daphne asked, in thinking about your presentation as a whole, I'm wondering, do you think visual material culture, political and academic discourse or community engagement are most important in quickly spreading awareness and acceptance of the social movement like the suffragette movement? That's a really, that's a really <laughs> good and big question. I think the thing that I think is really, that, that, that really struck me in doing this research is that it kind of took all of the different forces in the movement to create success. It took just like regular people wearing badges, men and women, um, people of all genders, you know, wearing suffrage messages to make people feel like, oh, this is like, you just needed to spread awareness. Like people needed to know it was a thing um, just on Sorry. one level. And that was really helpful. But then it was also important that some women that some women were, um, you know, trying to create new space for themselves by wearing different kinds of clothes, um, just creating kind of imagining of a different way of being feminine. Um, and in the end, it was really the fact that you had, um, you know, Alice Paul's group who were much more radical, who were like harping on Woodrow Wilson. They were uh, picketing the White House, which was not seen as a very, um, lovely and feminine uh, thing to do. Um, and let me see if I can um, just quickly share with you all, there were pins that were made uh, to honor the women who participated in this picket. Um, and those who were, who were jailed, many of them were jailed. So you have these more radical women who were during, during the war really calling out the president and saying, you say you're fighting for democracy, but half the US population can't vote. Um, Vicky, and, we're not seeing that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> we'll try it again. Um, and so um, oh, maybe I've I've uh, escaped my capacity to share again. <laughs> 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 but in any case, um, I'll post them on my Instagram. Um, but uh, you know, so you have those more radical women, and then and then that made the mainstream suffrage movement look 
totally rational to Wilson. He was like, I'd rather get in bed with these women um, who aren't calling me out. Um, so I think it, it kind of took a lot of the more radical acts, um, the wearing of bloomers, um, as well as um, the more kind of, um, you know, mainstream acts. Um, and of course, it's important to note too that um, not all women could vote after 1920 in the United States. It was really only white women um, who could vote. Um, uh, black women could vote in certain places. As I mentioned, um, Asian women weren't eligible for citizenship in the United States. Um, I think until like the end of World War II, maybe if I'm remembering correctly. So um, it was a it was a long fight that took kind of all the tactics. Mm -hmm. We have so many questions. I'm only going to be able to, to ask one more, although I will encourage you, I'm going to go back through the chat and collect them, but I'll encourage people to repeat them when we get to the end. But um, coming from Jay Diamond in Georgia, um, did suffragette pins ever draw the same level of stigma as bloomers? I think that we just lost Vicki. <clears throat> did we lose Vicki? Yeah, she just disappeared <laughs> she's just an apparition she doesn't exist jay we'll come back to your question um at the end okay i'm gonna go ahead and move on with our next speakers i'm sure that that vicky will join us in a moment